Good evening, brothers and sisters. I will now discuss the topic reform and counter reform. The okay, Catholic na po. Reformation. On the yes, po. Okay, thank you. The Catholic Church simultaneously manifested both the piety and corruption. The religious environment was both rich and confusing. Lateran V, the Fifth Lateran Council was the first serious official attempt to reform the church, although the very circumstances of its missing revealed the problems. True reform. The most prominent figure at Lateran V was Giles of Viterbo, the general of the Augustinians, who articulated the Orthodox Catholic idea that religion reforms men. Men do not reform religion, meaning the true reform or to form again consists simply in bringing one's behavior into accord with truth. The Evangelical Spirit The revival of sacred learning and the discovery of the new world marked the beginning of a great new era. Giles predicted and ironically, in view of what would soon happen, so too did the great project to build a new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Abuses. The bishops of Lateran V were highly critical of the religious orders because of their semi-independence from episcopal control and their sometimes scandalous behavior. Lateran V issued a compendium of condemnations against worldly Release bishops neglecting their responsibilities and cardinals living away from Rome. The council fathers castigated the clergy for irregular ways of attaining benefices, nepotism, and unchastity. But the council was not ready for sweeping reforms. Jimenez. The Spanish Church was to some extent reformed around 1,500, mainly under the leadership of Cardinal Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros. Personally austere, Jimenez warned, warred on clerical corruption. On one occasion, he even shipped a boatload of uncelibate priests across to Muslim North Africa. Reforming bishops. There were also reforming bishops in Italy and France. As an example, Gian Matteo, John Matteo Ghiberti of Verona set the pattern for later prelates by his vigorous reform of his clergy. His austere personal life and his conspicuous concern for the poor. New religious communities. As with every reform in the history of the church, much of the impetus originated with visionary leaders who battled corruption within the religious orders. Often, such efforts resulted in the founding of new religious communities. Capuchins. The split within the Franciscan order was resolved in 1517 when the conventuals were officially separated from observance. But the perennial issue of poverty led Matteo de Basio to found a third branch in 1525. Its members were called Capuchins because of the distinctive style of their hoods and they wore rough, untrimmed birds. The Capuchins espoused radical poverty and they devoted themselves to works of charity and to preaching in a plain, emotional style popular with common people. Ursulines, St. Angela Merici, together a group of consecrated virgins whom she named the Company of St. Ursula. Teaching children and ministering to the poor they might have become the first active community of sisters in the history of the church. Hospitallers, St. John of God and St. Camillus de Ledis were soldiers, one Portuguese, the other Italian, who lived 
worldly lives before conversion. They both founded orders to nurse the sick, respectively, the brothers' hospitalers and the ministers of the sick. Oratory of Divine Law The Oratory of Divine Law was founded in Venice, in some ways Europe's most worldly city, by a group of pious priests and laymen who sought to live a genuine Christian life. Three of these men would become major figures in the Catholic Reformation. Gasparo Contarini was the scion of a noble Venetian family and served his city as a diplomat. Reginald Fall was an Englishman of royal blood who imbibed the humanist spirit in Italy and befriended Contarini. A third founder of the oratory, John Pitt, Pietro Carafa was a bishop and papal diplomat who eventually ascended the papal throne as Paul IV. Pithins, from the Oratory of Divine Love, they developed a new religious community founded in 1524 by a bishop, St. Cahitan of Thien, and dubbed the Thethins after his diocese. His members, including Carafa, adopted a way of life different from that of both the monks and the friars. They wore no distinct habit and did not chant the divine office in common, but devoted themselves to preaching and to works of charity. The spirituals. Contarini and Paul were at the center of a loosely unified group that came to be called the Spirituals because they identified the principal problem of the Church as the absence of deep inner faith and urged spiritual regeneration as the essence of reform. The Zealots Garafa, although linked with Contarini and Paul by a commitment to the reform of the Church, nonetheless looked on the spirituals with increasing suspicion. He became, in effect, the head of a rival reform party dubbed the Zealots because of their eagerness to use disciplinary means to correct both heresy and moral disorders. Society of Jesus by far the most influential of the new religious communities was the Society of Jesus, whose enemies sarcastically pinned on them a negative epithet that stuck Jesuits. The order was founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, who was another converted soldier. Ignatius' decisive experience of this new world came during a battle in which his leg was shattered by a cannonball. During his long convalescence, Ignatius read all the tales of knightly daring he could find, then turned to the lives of the saints. Recognizing the saints as more heroic than the fabled knights, Ignatius was struck with a burning desire to be a knight for Christ. Ignatius left his sickbed determined to do God's will, but with only a hazy sense of what that might be. Sensing the need for an education, whatever use it might have, he practiced humility by sitting with children to learn Latin, then enrolled success successively into Spanish universities. In each, he encountered the spiritual sterility about which reformers complained which led him to offer guidance to his fellow students, especially concerning sin. He next went to the University of Paris, then the intellectual center of the Catholic world, and there he attracted a small band of companions, most of them laymen like himself, who sought to live the spiritual life in a serious way. In 1534, they took private vows, Ignatius still hoped to go to the Holy Land to convert the Muslims. But instead, he and his companions went to Rome to place themselves in the hands of the Pope. By now, all of them were priests, and they went about performing basic apostolic fasts, visiting the sick, aiding the poor, 
instructing children, preaching, hearing confessions, and offering spiritual direction. In 1540, Paul III recognized them as a new religious order. The rule that Ignatius presented for papal approval was to some extent similar to that of the Thetians and was in certain ways revolutionary. It departed almost entirely of monastic life. Ordinarily, Jesuits were to live in communities, but Ignatius foresaw that in some cases that might not be possible. They wore no distinctive habit, but only the conventional dress of the diocese and clergy. The most controversial feature of their life was that not only did they not gather in the chapel to recite the divine office in common, they were actually forbidden to chant it and enjoined to recite it privately. The point of all this was to orient the Jesuit toward activity in the world, eliminating those things that might impede apostolic zeal. All Jesuits took the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and an elite took a fourth vow of special obedience to the Pope. Whereas Francis of Assisi had made poverty the keynote of his community, Ignatius emphasized obedience. Unlike the quasi-republican structure of the monastic orders, Ignatius created a highly centralized organization, possibly on a military model. The Society of Jesus had no female branch, and Ignatius forbade Jesuits to give a spiritual direction to women. Ignatian spirituality could be characterized as a kind of holy pragmatism. While a student, he often spent long nights in prayer until he concluded that if God wanted him to be a student, he, need, he needed sufficient time for sleep and study. Asceticism, therefore, was to be practiced by his men only in moderation, so as to maintain the health and strength needed for work. The Jesuits adopted the motto, Ad Majorem Dei Gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Ignatius instructed his men to judge the most effective way of winning people to Christ, sometimes boldly and sternly, sometimes softly and by indirection, advice, advising Jesuits to listen much, say little, until they could discern how best to achieve their purposes. Enter by the other man's door, let him out through yours. Having been forced to abandon hope of converting the Muslims in the Holy Land, Ignatius directed the early Jesuits toward a variety of roles, theologians and controversialist advisors to princes, preachers, confessors, pastors, and missionaries. Ignatius sent St. Francis Xavier to the Orient, from which Xavier never returned, and in time, the Jesuits became the largest missionary order in the church. Because of their missionary zeal, their learning, perhaps because of their reputation for subtlety, Jesuits were sometimes employed as papal nuncios. Although the Jesuits eventually came to be thought of primarily as educators, Ignatius was at first reluctant to undertake that work because it would tie men down to a particular institutions, but he was eventually persuaded to acquiesce. Jesuits founded or taught in several universities, and a network of Jesuit secondary schools sprung up all over Catholic Europe in the later in the later 16th century. Evidence that Ignatius had indeed discerned the needs of the time was the fact that, except perhaps for the early Franciscans, no religious order in the history of the church grew more rapidly than the Jesuits 
in the first few generations of their existence. By 1627, the order had grown to more than 16,000 men. The Protestant Reformation, Luther. As Lateran V drew to a solemn clause in 1517, Gilles of Viterbo was unaware that as general of the Augustinians, he was the ultimate superior of a man who, within a few months, would ensure that most of the council's decrees were forgotten. Although great events are never the work of one man, the life of the German monk Martin Luther embodied the late medieval religious crisis in all its dimensions. Christendom was ripe for an explosion, and he lit the match. Luther was in many ways a medieval man, taking for granted that the monastic life was the highest way of living the Christian life. At a time of much corruption in religious life, Luther was a member of a reformed Augustinian house and claimed that on a trip to Rome, he was scandalized by the worldliness of some of the clergy. Like so many, Luther was educated by the brethren of the common life. When he translated the Bible into German, not the first to do so, he translated from the Vulgate, not from the Hebrew and Greek texts. Like the humanist, Luther became convinced that his scholastic theology was a distortion of Christian teaching, more Aristotle than Christ. He was trained in nominalist theology and was familiar with Toller's mystical writings, both of which perhaps gave him his acute sense of God as remote, all-powerful, angry, and condemnatory. Since the will of God was both supreme and inscrutable, men could not ask why they were slaves to sin, but simply had to accept the promise of salvation. Luther was nonetheless almost paralyzed by the conviction that, despite his best efforts, he was dumb, that he was hateful in the sight of God, who saw his every sin and did not forgive him. But at some point, while Lateran fit was in session, Luther, rereading Paul's letter to the Romans, was struck for the first time by what he understood to be the true meaning of this statement. The just man lives by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Suddenly, everything fell into place for him as he saw his oppressive sense of, of his own sinfulness, not as pathological, but as a true understanding of the condition of all men who were indeed hateful in God's eyes and indeed deserved damnation. Later, Luther then opposed the law to gospel. The law was given by God, not for man to fulfill or even to approximate, but in order to show him his utter inability to overcome his sinfulness. The good news of the gospel was the promise of salvation despite crippling sin, salvation by faith alone, by personal trust in the saving actions of Christ. For Luther, the church had failed in her most basic task. She could not offer people a sure road to salvation because she gave them a false sense of their own goodness based on a concept of natural virtue and on pious practices or good works. An indulgence. In 1517, Luther's personal spiritual breakthrough exploded into a cataclysmic public conflict triggered by the papal proclamation of an indulgence to raise funds for the building of St. Peter's Basilica. Technically, the indulgence was not being sold. Recipients had to be truly repentant of their sins as well as keep money, and poor people could gain the indulgence without payment. On any list of Catholic doctrines, indulgences would not rank near the top in importance but they proved to be precisely the point where the church was most vulnerable because many things came together there in a concrete way. Anxiety about sin and salvation, the credibility of official teaching, the significance of external acts, the rapaciousness of some of the clergy 
and the apparent sale of a spiritual guru. 95 Thesis A professor at the University of Wittenberg, Luther formulated his 95 Thesis, which he may or may not have posted on a church door. After encountering people who proudly displayed their indulgence certificates, the thesis were less an act of defiance than an invitation to debate a highly sensitive subject, although not in a spirit of academic detachment, because Luther believed that the salvation of souls was at stake. Without quite saying so, Luther seemed to deny the efficacy of indulgences altogether and even the existence of purgatory. Chip Grace. He accused the church of being too easygoing, of falsely assuring people of salvation, and thereby short-circuiting their process of repentance. But his anxiety also stemmed from his belief that, in requiring people to confess their sins and to overcome them, the church was imposing an impossible burden. Christians should instead accept the reality of sin and rely entirely on divine mercy, since, in Luther's view, sin is not so much a specific actions as it is man's very nature, his fundamental orientation toward evil. Sola is scriptura. Luther decisive break with the church occurred in 1519 when he entered into formal debate with the theologian Johann Eck. When Eck demonstrated that the doctrine and practice of indulgences were official Catholic teaching, Luther appeared, appealed first from the Pope to a general council, then from a council to a scripture, proclaiming that the Bible alone or sola scriptura was the locus of authority. Luther published three pamphlets that set forth his basic theology and sharpened his attack on Catholic doctrine. He condemned all man-made laws as contrary to the gospel and church that such things as indulgences and purgatory were devised by church authorities merely to control gullible people and extract money from them. Condemnation. Dio then formally condemned Luther and excommunicated him in a bowl that began, Arise, O Lord for a wild boar is loose in the vineyards of the church. Luther responded with a public burning of the bull and of the code of canon law. A radical theology. Luther, conclusion that indulgences were a distortion led him to question church authority. If the church was in error on crucial questions, evoked indulgences and the monastic life offered false assurances of sanctification, it followed that all other Catholic teachings were also subject to question. Luther began systematically measuring church teachings against the scripture as he understood it, rejecting almost the entire Catholic system. The authority of popes and bishops, seven sacraments, finally affirming only two, baptism and the Eucharist, purgatory, the invocation of the saints, and many other things. The Mass. The crucial issue was the sacrificial nature of the Mass. Catholic doctrine, properly understood, held that Christ's sacrifice on the cross accomplished the redemption of mankind but that in the Mass, the fruits of that redemption were made available through time, the continuation of the sacrifice of Calvary. For Luther, this undermined the uniqueness of Christ's sacrifice and made the Eucharist into a good work that the congregation offered to the Father. If the Mass was not a sacrifice, it followed that the clergy were ministers only, not priests, and all verbal or symbolic implications of sacrifice, like priestly vestments, marble altars, were to be suppressed. Luther never returned to the monastic life, concluding that the very idea of religious vow vows was fallacious and that no Christian received a divine call that differed from that of every other Christian. 
This implied the rejection of celibacy. And after a few years, Luther married one of the many nuns who had left their convents as a result of his exhortations. Beginning with Luther himself, the religiously disaffected did not at first think of themselves as breaking with the Catholic Church, but rather as attempting to reform her, an expectation that faded as the list of disputed doctrines and practices got longer and longer. As events unfolded, some evangelicals remained Catholics, while others broke with the Church. For a time, the latter continued to call themselves evangelicals, not Lutherans, indignantly insisting that they followed Christ, not a man. The faith of the humanist, Erasmus and the Fabre de Etaple, whatever their dissatisfactions with the church, remained Catholics, both dying in 1536. Erasmus made peace and charity the hallmarks of a true Christian, and despite his many criticism of Catholic doctrine and practice, always made the unity of the Church paramount, including a certain deference to papal authority and to tradition. Erasmus. At first, Erasmus congratulated Luther because indulgences were an example of what Erasmus considered superstition. But he was increasingly troubled at what he thought was Luther's heedless divisiveness and dogmatic denial of free will. Given his positive valuation of human nature, Erasmus also objected to Luther's extreme pessimism, and Luther in turn denounced Erasmus as someone who had let pagan ideas obscure his understanding of the gospel. Berkheimer Willibald Perkheimer was a wealthy German humanist, a friend of both Erasmus and Luther. He wrote to the Pope to defend Luther, but he seemed not to espouse fundamental Lutheran teachings, merely demanding that the Mass be said in the vernacular and that the communion be given to the laity in both kinds. Like Erasmus, he cautioned against breaking with the church, accusing some of the reformers of fostering unbridled liberty and saying that he would rather live under papal authority than under that of the reformers. A many-centered movement. If the Protestant Reformation had not been set off by Luther, it would have occurred in a different place around the same time, a classic illustration of the maxim that nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Other men besides Luther in other countries besides Germany were also demanding changes in the church. Zwingli. Huldich Zwingli was a parish priest of Zurich, Switzerland. He urged his flock to adhere more closely to the scriptures and warned against human innovations in religion. Swingley's teachings were quite similar to Luther's in many ways. Calvin, what eventually became the most widespread and influential of all Protestant movements, did not arise until half a generation after Luther. John Calvin was a Frenchman who, unusual among Reformation leaders, was a layman, trained as a humanist and a lawyer. Calvin settled in Geneva, where he was ordained, attempted to set up a model Christian community, and through his Institutes of the Christian Religion, produced the most comprehensive account of Protestant beliefs. His most Phasimus' doctrine was that of predestination, that God decreed from all eternity that some would be saved and others numbed, so that no human effort could have any effect. The Catholic response. Ultimately, the Reformation 
was a battle of ideas. But Catholics were somewhat slow in mounting a defense. Luther did not immediately get the debate he wanted because at first no one was prepared. A situation that was repeated in Swingley, Zurich a few years later. Catholic apologists were reluctant to write in the vernacular, lest it seemed that doctrine was being submitted to popular judgment and their formal scholastic style was not effective against the blunt, even vulgar, rhetoric of Luther and others. Catholics were also slow to make use of the printing press. Bible and Church The Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura is struck at the heart of the church, at the heart of the church's authority and forced a clarification of Catholic beliefs about which there was not total consensus. At issue was Christ promised to be with his church always and the continued presence of the Holy Spirit from which flowed the authority of doctrines and practices not found explicitly in the Bible, but that had unfolded over time. Central to the Catholic position was the fact that the church herself had determined the canonical texts of the scripture. It was thus impossible to set the Bible over the church. Prayerias and Kajitan. The Dominican Sylvester Prayeras, Leo's defense own theologian, actually made the Pope superior to scripture. The Dominican Cajetan Tommaso de Vio, one of the leading theologians of the day and soon to be a cardinal, was Luther's earliest opponent, sent to Germany by Leo X to persuade Luther to recant. He argued that while the seeds of all the doctrines were found in scripture by itself, it was inadequate as a guide to revelation. Tradition also has authority. Eck. Eck located revelation in the living church, guided by the Holy Spirit, in contrast to a written scripture that, if divorced from the believing community, was dead. And other Catholic apologists often cited the conclusion of the Gospel of John that Jesus said and did many things that were not written down, and they recall that he promised to send his Holy Spirit to guide the church. Piquet and Ellen Borg. The secular priest Albert Piquet thought that scripture had authority only because it has been accepted by the church and that since tradition preceded the scripture, it was therefore superior to it. The Benedictine Nicholas Ellen Borg thought that the Holy Spirit supplemented the truths taught by Christ when he was on earth and that the saints were the principal recipients of that inspiration. Henry VIII. King Henry VIII of England was a militant Catholic who wrote the defense of the seven sacraments to refute Luther, an act for which Clement the Seventh conferred on him the title Defender of the Faith. Thomas More. Thomas More wrote an early response to Luther, making him perhaps the first Erasmian humanist to recognize clearly what was at stake. A few years later, he was commissioned by the English bishops to refute William Tyndale, a priest who had become a Protestant and was sending his books to England from the Low Countries including the first complete English Bible, which differed from Catholic teaching and some of its translations. Moore argued that a vernacular Bible was unnecessary and that direct access to its scripture could be dangerous for untutored people. Late in the 16th century, the seminary set up in France to educate English priests produced the Doi Reigns Bible, the first Catholic, Catholic translation into English, which predated the King James Bible, but appeared long after Tyndale's translation. Jacopo Sadoletto, 
an Italian who was a bishop in southern France, wrote an open letter to the Genevans urging their return to Rome, professing loving solicitude for a people, he said, had been misled by crafty seducers who sowed doubt and division. Unlike most Catholic apologists, Sadoletto, who was associated with the spirituals, explicitly eschewed subtle philosophy in favor of simple obedience to the Word of God as preserved and expounded in the Church. Baronius, the polemical battle with Protestant Protestantism was fought on the basis of history as well as theology. Oratorian Cardinal Cesar Baronius attempted to show in his annals that the Church had preserved an unbroken tradition over the centuries. Bellarmine. Ultimately, the most influential Catholic theologian was the Italian Jesuit Saint, Saint Robert Bellarmine, who presented a systematic case for tradition and hierarchical authority. The crisis of piety, free will. Beyond the fundamental question of authority, Catholic apologists affirmed the domestic as opposed to the alchemist position that while God's will is sovereign, he ordered the universe according to a rational pattern and gave men limited free will. These theological issues probably passed over most people who understood their faith primarily in terms of piety, Marian devotions, the cults of the saints, prayers for the dead, pilgrimages, the veneration of relics and indulgences. The subtle doctrine of the real presence was a major issue between Catholics and Protestants, as demonstrated, for example, by people's kneeling or refusal to kneel as the Blessed Sacrament passed in procession. But the sharpest conflicts arose when religious changes left people feeling bereft of supernatural help, as happened when prayers to the saints were suppressed. Another blow to the vivid sense of the communion of saints was the denial of purgatory. This affected people even more deeply since it seemed to cut them off from their ancestors by forbidding prayers for the dead. Mary and the Saint. Devotion to Mary and the Saints had long been a source of comfort, but since Protestants insisted that they were no longer to be regarded as intercessors and protectors, their images and shrines were destroyed in those regions controlled by Protestants. Monasticism. Monasteries served as the destinations of pilgrims, places of hospitality for travelers, and centers of charity for the sick and poor, with considerable variations in their levels of generosity. Their dissolution excised institutions that had been an integral part of the local community for over a thousand years. Their suppression was symbolically revolutionary in seeming to condemn other worldly asceticism and insisting that the Christian life be lived entirely within the world. A, a frequent criticism of monks was that they lived unproductive lives and were a drain on economic resources. The failure of Sola Escriptura, the reformers did not teach the private interpretation of interpretation of scripture in the sense that each man's personal understanding was to be considered valid for himself rather they expected that the bible would speak plainly to everyone and there would be full agreement but quite early it became apparent that sola scriptura was an inadequate principle so that almost from the beginning the leading reformers had to invoke some kind of church authority against the free interpretation of scripture. Frustrated that the Bible did not say explicitly what he was convinced it meant, Luther added the word alone to Paul's proclamation that the just man lives by faith. 
and he considered discarding the letter of James, which he called an epistle of straw, because it exalted good works. The Magisterial Reformation versus the Radicals. The Reformers' beliefs required them to hold that the Church had deviated from the authentic gospel quite early, but Luther, Swingley, Calvin, and others came to be called the Magisterial Reformers. The Magisterial accepted the authority of the Ecumenical Councils through the 5th century, by which time the fundamental doctrines of the Trinity, a word that does not appear in Scripture, and the Incarnation had been defined. Luther and Swingley. When Luther and Swingley finally met, they agreed on most things, but not on the meaning of Christ's words, This is my body, with Swingley insisting that he must have been speaking metaphorically, and Luther insisting on the literal meaning, each claiming that the other misunderstood Christ's words. Luther held that while bread and wine remained, they also became the actual body and blood of Christ, a doctrine later called consubstantiation, substances together, while Swingley saw the bread and wine as mere symbols of Christ, body and blood. A. The Yahura. The question of externals also greatly divided some of the reformers, with Lutherans accepting a diaphora, or things indifferent, so long as the Bible did not explicitly forbid them, while Swingley and others would only allow those things that the Bible explicitly authorized. Swingley was the first of what were later called Puritans, who wanted to purify the Church of what they saw as historical as accretions that smacked of superstition. Anabaptist Luther, as did Zwingli, had to confront small groups of zealots who, without formal ordination, dared to preach in public and, most seriously, demand that those who had been baptized as infants, practically everyone, be rebaptized as adults, a practice that led to their being called Anabaptist, to baptize again. Protestant scholasticism. The magisterial leaders denounced the radicals as false prophets, expelled them from their cities, and often put them to death, while Anabaptists, in turn, accused those leaders of compromising their own principles. Despite humanist and Protestant hostility to scholastic theology, some Protestants even began to theologize in the scholastic mode, as in the Lutheran formula of consubstantiation in order to clarify disputed questions. Church and State Clergy and Politics The Church as an institution was deeply involved in politics in the narrow sense, even apart from religious issues. The papacy had its own territorial interest and prelates were often secular as well as spiritual lords. Political and social prominence did not necessarily mean that the prelate was corrupt. Jimenez and Terenza lived austere lives and Wolsey, although quite worldly, became increasingly pious toward the end of his life. Politics and belief. Ultimately, the success or failure of the Reformation in particular areas was due almost entirely to the policies of its rulers. The Reformation succeeded mainly in Northern Europe, in the territories that had not been part of the Roman Empire. Though Protestantism made some inroads into Eastern Europe, it did not become the dominant cultural influence there. Charles V. Charles V recognized the emergent Lutheran movement as a threat to imperial unity, but it was only with difficulty that he was able to obtain Luther's condemnation of the Diet of Forms. The word Protestant was originally applied not to theological dissent, but to those who protested Charles V's announced intention of suppressing their movement. Failed compromise. Charles at one point offered 
the Lutherans clerical marriage and communion in both kinds and offer they rejected us too little even as Pope Clement VII saw it as the emperor's unwarranted assumption of ecclesiastical authority. The Augsburg Confession of 1530 was the first Lutheran statement of faith and was agreed to it in part by some Catholics, but it did not achieve complete acceptance and failed to heal the bridge. Church Property Luther urged the princess to undertake the forcible reform of the church if the clergy would not, charging that her great wealth had been stolen from gullible Germans. Like Henry VIII, a few years later, princess who accepted Luther's invitation became almost by default the heads of the church in their domains, justifying their seizure of church property. The free cities. The empire also encompassed a number of free cities, where civic authorities had the last word on such issues as the manner of the celebration of the liturgy. The Peasants' War. Lutheranism was almost dealt a fatal blow by the massive Peasants' War of 1524 to 1525, when thousands of poor farmers rose up against their lords. A manifesto issued by the rebels, probably composed by a priest, cited Luther's word, words about Christian freedom as justification for their actions. And Luther at first responded by condemning the rebellion, but also faulting the princess for injustices. Lutheran freedom. The rebellion was put down with great brutality and Luther made it clear that his idea of Christian freedom from law applied only to spiritual matters because through freedom was interior. The Turkish threat. Looming always over the German situation was the threat of the Turks who continually menaced the empire's eastern borders. Charles' move against the Lutherans finally came in 1546, immediately provoking a Protestant rebellion that a dying Luther, because of his view of the sanctity of civil authority, could not bring himself to endorse. Habsburgs and Balwa. The long-standing habsburgs balwa conflict was the central reality of European politics, destroying any possibility of a united Catholic political front. When Charles V was on the verge of defeating the German Lutherans, Henry II of France, even as he struggled to suppress the Calvinists in his own domains, sent an army to help the Lutherans. Peace of Augsburg. Faced with a stalemate, Charles in 1555 negotiated a settlement, the Peace of Augsburg. That, however limited, was the first official recognition of religious tolerance in European history. Ironically, in view of Luther's bringing declarations of his spiritual freedom, the Peace of Augsburg was summed up in the maxim, Cutius Regio, Etius Religio, whose rule his religion which allowed each prince to determine the religion of his subjects and required non-conformists to go into exile, while the free cities were required in theory to tolerate both Catholics and Lutherans. In some places, those who did not adhere to the official religion could leave the territory on Sunday to worship in a neighboring jurisdiction. Scandinavia Lutheranism spread rapidly throughout northern Germany and into Scandinavia, where the way was prepared by scholars who had discovered abroad. The final decision, however, were made by the kings of Denmark, Frederick I and Christian III, who also ruled Norway, and Gustavus I, Vasa, or Vasa, king of Sweden, who also ruled Finland. France, Gallicanism. Just as there was an Anglican or English church that was founded by Henry VIII in 1534, which split from Rome, there was also a Gallican or French church 
that maintained formal ties to the papacy while seeking to remain as independent as possible. In a concordat or agreement that would plague the papacy for three centuries, Pope Leo X officially recognized the French king's right to nominate bishops and many other high church officials, although papal ratification was required. Huguenots from Geneva, Calvin sent trained clergy back to France, where they made converts among both the aristocracy and the merchant class. Civil War. At first, Catherine forced Catholics to engage in theological discussion with the Huguenots. However, when an agreement was not forthcoming, both sides began committing acts of violence against each other, especially while their opponents were at worship. The violence escalated into a civil war that lasted for most of the rest of the century. The Massacre of St. Bartholomew on St. Bartholomew's Day, August 24, Catholics began systematic, systematically slaughtering Protestants in Paris and other cities, killing as many as 5,000. The St. Bartholomew Massacre became the most infamous religious atrocity in a century filled with such atrocities. Catherine and Charles may have instigated the massacre in order once again to pit guises and organs against one another. Henry IV. The civil war continued. In 1588, the Duke of Guise was murdered at Henry III's instigation, and the next year, the king himself was assassinated by a Dominican friar, Jacques Clement, probably in retaliation. Clement was killed on the spot and was venerated by some Catholics as a martyr. Henry of Bourbon, who had reverted to Protestantism after St. Bartholomew's Day, now claimed the throne as Henry IV, 1589-1610, and made good his claim by taking control of Paris. A few years later, he announced his reconversion to Catholicism, allegedly with the cynical remark, Paris is worth a mass, although it was later reported that he had become a sincere Catholic. Epic of Nantes, Henry IV, triumphed and in 1598 ended the 40-year-old French religious struggle by issuing the Ethic of Nantes, which gave the Huguenots freedom of worship. Henry IV proved to be a popular king who restored order to the kingdom, but in 1610 he too was assassinated by a Catholic because of the king's plan, plans for war with Spain. England in England, a rapid series of religious changes were almost entirely acts of state. This began during the reign of Henry VIII and continued for the next 40 years. The Royal Marriage Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella and Charles V's aunt, a union that gave him only one living offspring, his daughter Mary. Worried about the survival of the two-door dynasty and attracted to a younger woman, Anne Bogin, Henry petitioned Pope Clement VII for an annulment of his marriage. Clement VII, partly in deference to the emperor, Clement followed the policy of delay probably hoping that Henry's interest in Anne would cool. The basis for the requested annulment was also problematical, since for the Pope to acquiesce would be to limit papal authority over marriage, forever thereafter forbidding marriage to a brother's widow as contrary to the law of God. The Attack on the Papacy When the court set up by the Pope to hear the case failed to deliver a verdict, the king's frustration boiled over. Cardinal Thomas Wolseley, who was both Henry's Lord Chancellor and one of the two papal judges assigned to the case, fell from power. Excommunication. Apparently wishing to placate Henry as far as possible, Clement quickly confirmed Henry's nomination of the royal chaplain Thomas Cranmer as Archbishop of Canterbury. 
Cranmer, who had Protestant leanings and was secretly married, immediately declared Henry's marriage to Catherine in body and officiated at his marriage to Vaulin, whereupon Clement at last reached a decision and excommunicated both Henry and Anne. Supreme Head Far from being deter deterred by the papal action, Henry in 1534 had himself declared supreme head of the church in England. Suppression of the monasteries. The exception to the case Catholicism was monasteries, which he ruthlessly suppressed in order to get possession of their wealth. King and bishops. Henry's position as supreme head of the church meant that loyalty to the Pope was now treason. And in a brief period, Henry put it that everyone would refuse to affirm the new order, including Fisher and Thomas More. More did not openly oppose the king, but instead resigned from public office and retired to private life. But Henry demanded his old friend's overt support, and when More would not give it, he was executed on the basis of perjured testimony. Paul, at first a moderate conciliarist, had written a strong defense of papal authority that earned him the king's undying enmity and led to the brutal judicial murder of Paul's elderly mother, Margaret Paul. Edward VI, when Henry died, the throne passed to his young son, Edward VI, an ardent, theologically precocious Protestant who encouraged Cranmer and others working through Parliament to move the Anglican Church further toward continental Protestantism. Mary I. When the city Edward died at age 16, the throne passed to his older half-sister, Mary I. The Catholic Restoration just as her father and her brother had used royal authority and a cooperative parliament to take England out of the Catholic Church, Mary now used the same methods to bring it back. In keeping with the new reform spirit, she, nomi she nominated bishops whose careers had been spent primarily in the church, not the state, an action whose wisdom was vindicated when all but one of them remained Catholic after her death and had to be deposed by her successor. Paul returned to England as Archbishop of Canterbury and Papal Legate and in those capacities oversaw the formal return of his native country to the Church. Elizabeth I, the throne that passed to Mary's half-sister Elizabeth I, daughter of Anne Boleyn, who at first gave ambiguous, ambiguous signals as to her personal beliefs, but soon committed herself to a Protestant restoration. Puritanism, the desire for a Protestantism untainted with Catholic elements like bishops, was strongest in London and the mercantile southeast, while Catholicism was strongest in the feudal north. Excommunication of Elizabeth. Possibly in response to the 5th and 69th rebellion, Pius V the next year excommunicated Elizabeth, dismissing her as a pretended monarch and releasing the English people from their allegiance to her. Missionary priests. Around 1570, missionaries began arriving in England, the best known of whom were Jesuits but most of whom were secular clergy educated at English seminaries in France and Spain. They were missionaries in the sense that, oh, that ultimately they hoped to convert the entire kingdom. The story of the English missionaries is one of the most dramatic in the history of the church, combining a heroic commitment to their cause, including martyrdom, with clandestine clock and dagger activities such as false identities and hiding in secret in secret rooms called priest holes. Priests, along with those laymen who aided them directly, were treated as traitors if caught. 
to put death by being hanged, cut down alive, and disemboweled. Rebellion, most Catholics, including most priests, eschewed politics and ceasing that their sole concern was the salvation of souls. However, some others, including the influential Jesuit Robert Parsons and Cardinal William Allen, whom the Holy See treated as the head of the English Catholics, believed that the Queen should be overthrown. The Armada. Philip II in 1588 launched his Great Armada against England. 30,000 men in 130 ships with the aim of deposing Elizabeth in a court with pious bull. Philip aimed to place a Catholic on the English throne. Mary Stuart and the Scots. Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, grandniece of Henry VIII, the eighth and daughter of a guy's mother succeeded to the throne of Scotland after having been widowed by Francis II of France. Posthumously, Mary became a Catholic heroine, but she was not a candidate for sainthood. She made no effort to combat Presbyterianism, and her personal life was full of scandal. James the sixth and first, but when the never married Elizabeth died in 1603, the English throne passed to James the fourth, uh, the sixth of Scotland, the son whom Mary Stuart had been forced to leave behind as an infant when she fled her own country. Thus, he was also James the first of England, though James had been baptized a Catholic, he had been raised as a Protestant. Ireland. A papal nuncio sent to Ireland in the 1540s stayed only a month and complained to the corruption of the clergy and the fractiousness of the nobles made it impossible to achieve religious reform. The Netherlands. When Charles V divided the Salzburg domains in 1556, the Netherlands remained under the rule of Spain, even though in geography, language, and religion, it would have fit better with the empire. Philip II. After Charles' abdication, Philip II, as king of Spain and his vast overseas domains, was a leading Catholic monarch in, of Europe, and he took very seriously his divine mandate to defend the church and suppress heresy. In 1565, he announced that the Inquisition would be enforced in the Netherlands, an announcement that brought forth immediate protest from almost all sections of society. Rebellion. The arrival of a Spanish army under the sometimes brutal Duke of Alba, who had earlier invaded the Papal States during the interminable Italian wars, galvanized the Netherlands into massive resistance that was helped by Catholic France in order to strike a blow at Spain. Despite many setbacks, by 1572, the Northern Netherlanders had successfully driven out the Spanish troops, leaving Spain in control of the Southern provinces that would eventually become the nation of Belgium. Poland. In Poland, Cardinal Stanislaus Hosius presided over vigorous counter-reformation efforts, but there remained a significant Protestant presence. Poland became one of the most tolerant countries in Europe, a place of refuge for sectarians not welcome even in Lutheran and Calvinist lands. Hungary, though it remained mostly Catholic, Part of Hungary was under Muslim rule in the 16th century. There was a significant Calvinist presence, especially among the nobility. Persecution and toleration. Both the idea and the reality of Christendom as a single international society virtually disappeared in the 16th century. But the concept, but the concept of a unified society based 
on faith survived and was even strengthened at the national and local levels. The secular arm. The Inquisition was not the only body employed in religious persecution. France set up the Chamber Arden or Burning Court to deal with heresy and in England. And in England, heresy was also prosecuted under civil law. Martyrdom. In the 16th century, all serious Christians were potentially faced with the possibility of persecution, as illustrated by the war by the war of words between Moore and Tyndale, which continued until both were sent to their deaths in 1535. Moore, by his former patron Henry VIII, Tyndale by the Inquisition at Antwerp. Erasmus came close to advocating toleration and his careless urging of forbearance and charity among Christians. But more, while he suffered death for his faith, himself participated in the prosecution of heretics. This was not hypocrisy. Men did not demand for themselves a toleration they denied to others, but demanded simply the truth be promoted and error vanished. The Radical Reformation. The left wing of the Reformation, those generally, if imprecisely called Anabaptists alone, rejected the idea that religious conformity should be enforced by civil authority because they did not think it either possible or desirable to organize the whole society on Christian principles. Spain, the long struggle for the Reconquista of Spain gradually reached its goal during the 15th century. The marriage of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon in effect created a united Spain for the first time, although the two kingdoms remained officially distinct. The Catholic monarchs, as Pope Alexander VI designated them, mounted a final assault on the Muslim Kingdom of Granada, which fell in 1492. The Conversos. The Conversos. A wave of anti Jewish violence broke out in Castile around 1400 and soon spread throughout much of the Iberian Peninsula. A century later, at the urging of Jimenez, the Crown embarked on a program of forced conversions, creating a new category of people. The conversos were suspected of secretly practicing their old religion. Inquisition. Aragon and Castile shared the Inquisition, a special Spanish branch of which was established by papal authority but, ex but existed under royal control and was used for political as well as religious purposes since the presence of large numbers of Muslims and Jews seemed to threaten political stability. The Inquisition was concerned with possible heresy, but its primary interest was in the conversos. Probably most of the first generation of converts were in fact of doubtful sincerity. However, later generations produce a disproportionate number of important people who were also exemplary Catholics. Martyrdom in England. Moore, Fisher, and a small group of Cartusians and Franciscans execu executed by Henry VIII were the first Catholic martyrs of the Counter-Reformation. About 130 Catholic priests were killed in the Netherlands during the religious conflicts there, most of them by armies or by mob violence rather than through formal persecution, as also happened in France. By far, the largest group of Catholic martyrs was in England. The number of Catholics martyred during Elizabeth's 45 years reign was about the same as the number of Protestants martyred during her half-sister's five-year reign, including Cranmer after he had twice recanted his heresy, then recanted his recantations. Protestant martyrs. The first Protestant martyrs of the age were two members of Luther's Augustinian order buried at Brussels in 1523. An estimated 4,400 Protestants were put to death in all countries, many of them by other Protestants, since Anabaptists were subject to the death penalty almost everywhere. Roman Inquisition. 
the Roman Inquisition was given renewed authority in the face of protestant protestantism, but its effectiveness in the various Italian city states depended on the cooperation of the local governments. Bruno, in one of its most famous cases, the Inquisition in 1600 burned Giordano Bruno, a Dominican who was accused of heresy, but who was in many ways scarcely a Christian at all. Inquisitorial procedures. The Inquisition operated according to strict rules that were fair by the standards of its time. Most of those summoned were denounced anonymously, but although not entitled to confront their accusers, they were allowed to submit a list of enemies who might wish to harm them and who were punished if found to be lying. Recantation. The Inquisition sought to uncover the truth, not to punish people and discriminately, since its principal aim was to bring about conversions. Torture was used when a suspect was thought to be lying, but it was used sparingly because the inquisitors did not want insincere confessions, and such confession could be recanted within 24 hours. Those investigated. Despite the Inquisition, few Protestants were put to death in Italy and Spain, simply because there were very few, and the Inquisition concerned itself with morals, witchcraft, suspicious foreign visitors, and Catholics who had traveled in Protestant lands or had been ransomed from the Muslims and might therefore have been affected by Muslim beliefs. Questionable groups. The Spanish Inquisition also concerned itself with the alumbrados or enlightened ones, a mystical movement of Franciscan origins that emphasized the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit and total passivity in the hands of God. Nicodemism, named after the Pharisee who visited Jesus only in secret, was the name given to those who conformed to the official religion in order to avoid persecution while continuing to practice another faith in secret. Both Catholic and Protestant leaders denounced this, but there were occasional notable examples, such as a Swiss bishop who publicly presided at the Catholic liturgy while secretly participating in Calvinist prayer services. Martyrdom. Protestants recalled Old Testament martyrs, while Catholics claimed the innumerable, innumerable early Christians who had suffered under the Roman Empire. For centuries, those saints had been venerated primarily for their patronage, curing illnesses, for example. Both Protestants and Catholics kept martyriologies of the recent heroes of their faiths, emphasizing the way in which the martyrs had gone to their deaths joyfully and with unshakable courage, but at the same time warning that courage alone was not a guarantee of truth. Misguided fanatics might face death as resolutely as through martyrs. Sangis Martyrum. As in the early centuries, the blood of martyrs was the seed of Christians, as the great deaths on both sides aroused, aroused admiration and sometimes conversions. English Catholics dipped cloths in the blood of martyr priests and spirited away parts of their bodies, venerating them as saints long before they were officially canonized. A share in the passion. For Catholics, martyrdom also offered the ultimate way of sharing in the passion of Jesus, and more meditated on that in prison. The problem of royal authority. Obedience to the monarch was rendered problematical in the 16th century by the fact that many devout believers found themselves living under governments that promoted what the believers considered a false faith. The right of rebellion. The right of subjects to battle, even including the right to assassinate a tyrant, was restricted by those who lose such toleration. Calvin himself is a skeptical but the providence asserted the right, as did the Jesuit theologians Bellarmine and Francisco Suarez, claimed that the Pope alone 
had the authority directly from God and that the authority of the state existed only for the needs of the people. Presbyterianism, Calvinism's Presbyterian structure, government by councils of clergy with strong lay involvement, fit well with the Republican government of most of the cities, but Calvinism also appealed to few nobles in France, Germany, and Scotland. Religion and society, wealth. Conversely, although Calvinism had a special appeal to the commercial middle class, the Catholic merchants of the Italian city republics did not find it necessary to change their religion. Classical Calvinism did not teach that wealth was a sign of divine favor, nor did Calvinism give birth to capitalism, which had existed for a long time. Both Calvin and some Catholic moralists offered cautious justification for the profit motive and began to distinguish between usury and interest on loans to business ventures, although Luther did not. Morality. Protestants and Catholics differed very little over practical moral questions, with Protestant leaders continuing to condemn the practice of contraception, for example, while Catholics, Anglicans, and Lutherans did not condone prostitution, dancing, gambling, or drunkenness, they tended to tolerate those things as perennial and unavoidable sins that could be restrained but not suppressed. The poor. Perhaps due mainly not to religion, but to the development of capitalism, attitudes toward charity were changing. In Protestant countries, the abolition of monasticism implied that poverty no longer had passed to value and was to be eliminated by one means or another. Medieval almsgiving had been somewhat indiscriminate, giving unconditionally to those who begged something that fulfilled God's will and thereby contributed to one's own salvation. The Road to Reform The Popes For decades, the Popes of the Reformation period were scarcely able to cope with the religious crisis. The Sack of Rome in 1527, the imperial troops, mostly mercenaries, many of them Lutherans, who had not been paid for a long time, entered Rome and subjected it to a brutal sacking that went on for a week and forced Clement VII to take refuge in the castle St. Angelo. The sack of Rome was one of the low points in the, in the entire history of the city, and Clement interpreted it as divine punishment for his own sins and those of Rome. Paul III. Papal support for the reforming impulse in the church began with Paul III, who had led a scandalous life. The Roman Curia had for a long time been a place of notorious corruption, and Paul began the mundane but important change of the reform of canon law and papal finances, especially the abolition of the intricate network of exemptions from rules that had been the cause of so much corruption. The Commission for Reform. Most importantly, Paul named Contarini, Carafa, Paul, and Sadoleto to a commission for the reform of the church, the result of which in 1536 was a blunt diagnosis of evils and how they were to be corrected, not spewing the papacy itself. Spirituals. Protestantism placed the spiritual party of Catholic reformers in a difficult position since the Pauline doctrine of justification was now the principal basis of dissent from Catholic teaching, forcing men like Paul and Contarini to struggle to formulate the concept of justification by faith in such a way as also to affirm that good works did have merit in the eyes of God. Regent's work. The viability of their position was, test, was tested in 1542 when Contarini represented the Holy See at a conference at Regensburg or Ratisbon in Germany, 
where an attempt was made to resolve the Catholic Lutheran differences. Apostasis. The spirituals suffered acute embarrassment when Bernardino Aquino, the third general of the Capuchins and a renowned preacher of reform, shocked the Catholic world by fleeing from Italy and eventually going to Geneva, where he became a Calvinist. The Council of Trent. Difficulties throughout the history of the Church, great crises have usually been resolved by a general council, and cries for another such meeting began almost as soon as Lateran V ended. Not until 1545, more than a quarter of a century after the beginning of Lutheranism, were the obstacles overcome sufficiently to enable Paul III to summon a council of Trent. Factions. There were recognizable factions at the council, some along national lines, others doctrinal. As in previous councils, the final decrees were sometimes the result of negotiations that resulted in ambiguous wording. The three sessions. The first session lasted less than two years, suspended because war broke out in Germany and the seas struck the city of Trent. The second session did not meet until 1555 under the aegis of Julius III, who had been one of the original papal legates at the council. It too soon ended, both because of war and because following Julius' death and the brief interim pontificate, Carafa was elected Pope as Paul IV, and he opposed the council as a threat to papal authority. The final session, the final session of Trent, by far the most productive of the three, met from 1561 to 1563 under the ages of Pius IV, who officially approved all the conciliar decrees. Doctrine and discipline. After much debate, the council decided to consider disciplinary and doctrinal issues simultaneously, both correcting abuses and clarifying and amplifying doctrine. The sins of the clergy. The Reformation was a protest against clerical misconduct. Zwingli, for example, admitted that as a priest he had been unchaste, and Luther jived at fornicating clergy primarily to urge that they take wives. Pluralism. The root of abuses, as had been diagnosed on many previous occasions, was the bishops' neglect of their dioceses, where they were responsible for right order. Episcopal authority. Although the decrees were not controversial in themselves, they provoked debate over whether bishops received the authority from the Holy See or directly from God. Jesuit theologians, in particular, upheld papal authority and some bishops expounded an ecclesiology that was almost Eastern Orthodox in its assertions of Episcopal autonomy. Seminaries. While members of religious orders were adequately educated in their monasteries and elite clergy attended universities, Trent recognized the low state of education of many of the parish clergy, most of whom in effect learned by the apprenticeship system. The council therefore decreed that each diocese was to establish a seminary or seat place where candidates for ordination could be properly formed intellectually and spiritually and carefully scrutinized as to their worthiness. Marriages. The council forbade clandestine marriages, those celebrated without prior public announcement and without the presence of the parish priest and two witnesses, but at the same time, it permitted marriage without the consent of the parents, something that some civil governments did not allow. Clarity of doctrine. To an extent, many Catholics in the earlier 16th century were responsive to Protestantism because they found themselves confronted with ideas they had never heard before. For example, the Eucharist was sacred, but the concept of transubstantiation meant little. Trent also authorized the first comprehensive catechism of Catholic doctrine. 
anathema. Trent condemned heretical propositions but did not attribute them to anyone by name, a procedure designed to avoid controversies as to whether particular persons actually held the condemned doctrines. Each proposition stated a false belief and declared of those who held it, let them be anathema, a Greek word for condemned. Scripture, the root of all theological issues, was the nature and locus of authority. The Council affirmed the authority of the Vulgate, including those books, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Maccabees 1 and 2, that Protestants had rejected as uncanonical, and it declared that no one could interpret the Scripture in many ways contrary to the doctrines of the Church. Most significantly, the Council affirmed unwritten tradition as a source of truth along with the Bible, the authenticity of the tradition guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Grace and Free Will As at Regensburg, the issue of justification was recognized as both the heart of the theological conflict and as the subtlest and most difficult of issues. The opposing errors being on the one hand the Protestant denial of the efficacy of good works and on the other a Pelagian optimism about human nature. Justification. The Tridentine definition of justification was subtle. Men stood condemned because of original sin and were saved only by the sacrifice of Christ. They had to respond freely to the offer of salvation. But that response was made possible only by predisposing grace that was offered to all without any merit on their part, since God desired that all should be saved. Once accepted, such grace rendered human works meritorious in God's sight, so that, contrary to the Lutherans, justification was not merely imputed to men by a merciful God, but men were actually made right use by Christ's sacrifice. Indulgences. On the issue that had set off the Reformation, the Council reaffirmed the doctrine and practice of indulgences, indulgences but decreed that their reception should not, except for the Crusada in Spain, be tied to any kind of monetary payment. In response to another frequent complaint, it warned against the abuse of excommunication for trivial purposes, especially those having to do with money. Ecclesial issues. The ecclesial issues that had made agreement impossible at Regensburg were defined with relative ease. Seven sacraments rather than two. The sacraments as actually conferring grace, not merely symbolizing it. The sacraments as having their effect ex opere operato that is, by objective divine power, not the subjective state of the priest or the recipient, the Mass as a continuation of the sacrifice of Calvary, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, transubstantiation, the appropriateness, therefore, of Eucharistic adoration, the power of the keys, whereby priests had the ability to forgive sins in the name of Christ, purgatory, the invocation of the saints, the veneration of images and relics, prayers for the dead. On disputed disciplinary issues, priestly celibacy was reaffirmed, celebration of Mass in the vernacular was forbidden, and Christ was declared to be present, whole and entire, under both Eucharistic species. Thus, it was not necessary to receive communion under both kinds, and laymen were not permitted to do so. As part of the renewed Eucharistic piety, Trent also encouraged more frequent communion. Although surprising to modern Catholics, the Council thought that weekly communion was sufficient, even for those in an advanced stage of training for the priesthood, and monthly communion was sufficient for nuns. The Jesuit theologians. Jesuits were among the leading champions of orthodoxy. The Spaniard Diego Lainez, who succeeded Ignatius as general of the society, was perhaps the most important theologian at Trent, where he especially upheld papal authority. The Index. 
Plus, Langford and Fifth had urged the censorship of books and Trent renewed that demand, leading to the formal establishment of the Index of Forbidden Books, which began with theological works but eventually expanded to encompass philosophical works considered fallacious and works of fiction deemed to be immoral. Liturgy. Trent equipped almost complete uniformity of liturgy throughout the church, something that was perhaps made possible for the first time by the printing press, which allowed the approved Roman Missal or Mass book to be used everywhere. The Tridentine spirit. Trent was a beginning, not an end, and for the next two centuries, reformed minded popes and bishops had this struggle against entrenched political and ecclesiastical interests to implement its decrees. The spirit of the Catholic Reformation forged a trend was one of strict orthodoxy and morality, deep personal piety, and obedience to church authority, a revival that was profoundly successful in giving the church a character that would endure for 400 years. The effects of trend. Pope Paul IV. Paul IV, who as a cardinal had set up the Roman Inquisition and as Pope established the index, enforced clerical good conduct by imprisoning or exciting those whom he considered corrupt and imposing draconian laws on Rome where prostitution had been right. Ignatius Loyola had his own mandate of obedience tested when Paul required the Jesuits to resume the monastic practice of the communal office, something Ignatius thought undermined their work. When asked what he would do if the society were suppressed, Ignatius responded that he would accept it as the divine will. He died during Paul the Fourth's pontificate without knowing if his order would survive. Pope Pius IV. Pius IV expelled his predecessor's unworthy relatives, even executing a Carafa cardinal. Pius was himself a nepotist, but some of his relatives proved to be exemplary, notably St. Charles Borromeo, whom Pius made Archbishop of Milan, a cardinal and papal secretary of state when the prelate was only 21 years old. Borromeo proved to be the model of a counter-reformation bishop. Pope Pius V. Saint Pius V, the last pope to be canonized for three centuries, was an ascetic Dominican who had been head of the Inquisition and who vigorously implemented the decrees of Trent, including publishing the Catechism Missal and Breviary, a short divine office authorized by the Council. Pope Gregory XIII, although Gregory XIII had fathered a child, he was a conscientious pope, particularly in streamlining the papal court to eliminate offices that tend to be mere excuses to collect fees, thereby reducing some of the taxes that had aroused white resentment. Gregory's most lasting achievement was promulgating the new calendar that bore his name, which was devised in order to eliminate discrepancies in the existing solar calculations. Among other things, it restored January 1 as the beginning of the new year. Pope Sixtus V. Highly unusual for the time, Sixtus V, a Franciscan of blunt manners, was of peasant origins. Black Gregory had led a less than exemplary life, but once elected, he proved to be a draconian moralist like Paul IV, enforcing order in the papal states, vigorously prosecuting both heresy and civil crime, even imposing the death penalty for adultery. Nuncios. In the late 16th century, the Holy See formalized its system of papal nuncios or heralds or ambassadors, partly because a whole territory could be won back to the church if the ruler himself were converted. Saints, Borromeo. The great 
to reform at the local level was a zealous bishop, of whom there were an increasing number after the midpoint of the century. Borromeo was the model, leading an austere life of prayer and penance, visiting paid victims, and relentlessly striving to reform his clergy. Francis Borzu, witness to the success of reform of St. Francis Borzu, a Spanish duke who first brought the Jesuits into his territory, then joined them, becoming Ignatius' second successor as general of the society. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa de Cepeda y Ahumada, joined a Carmelite convent whose man whose nuns were mostly as aristocrats who, by traditional Carmelite standards, led somewhat pampered lives. But she underwent a conversion and as Mother Superior began reforming her convent, requiring the nuns once again to go without shoes or disgust and forcing a strict discipline of prayer, poverty, and self-denial. Philip Neri. Saint Philip Neri was an eccentric Roman priest who took delight in revelry and jokes and often wore odd clothes. He gathered together a group of men to work among the poor, then formed them into a new community, the Oratorians, from the, from the Latin word for prayer. Spiritual Renewal, Penance. Trent sought for unity between interior and exterior, as in its approach to the sacrament of penance. The formal confession of mortal sins to a priest was required, but great stress was also laid on genuine contrition. Reform of lay morals was part of the general program of renewal, so that in places visited by vigorous preachers, there was sometimes a measurable decline in the rate of illegitimate words. Frequent recourse to the sacrament of penance was taken as a hallmark of authentic Catholicism, the primary means through which lay people were disciplined in the practice of their faith. The spiritual exercises. Recalling the spiritual confusion he had encountered among his fellow students in Spain, Ignatius conceived the characteristically bold idea that lay people and secular clergy needed a spiritual formation, just as about religious faith. Some late medieval spiritual directors urged their disciples to undertake spiritual exercises, plant and organize regiments of a prayer and penance, and Ignatius was familiar with much of that literature composed the spiritual exercises as a handbook for spiritual directors laying out for the first time a systematic plan for what came to be called retreats. Mysticism. The Catholic mystical tradition was carried to new heights during the 16th century, especially by the Carmelites in Spain. This greatest flowering of mysticism in the history of the Church, while remaining firmly Catholic, plumbed the interior of the soul more deeply than any Protestant undertook to do. Teresa of Avila. For Teresa, the spiritual life was not the deliberate cultivation of esoteric experiences, but simply living and praying as a Christian should. The practical life. Although in the mystical experience, the soul transcended the mundane world, it did not abandon the world. To the contrary, Teresa, who was herself intensely active all her life, insisted that the spiritual life be lived amidst daily responsibilities, to the point where she even urged superiors to restrict the time for prayer of nuns who neglected their mundane duties. Orthodoxy if some earlier schools of mysticism were suspected of heterodoxy, Teresa insisted on complete adherence to the teachings of the Church. Not well educated herself, she told her readers to submit themselves to the judgment of competent theologians. She was the first woman to be declared a doctor of the Church.
because what she lacked in formal theology, she more than made up for in spiritual wisdom. Consolations for Teresa, as with Iglesias, the individual began with an acute sense of sin and a determination to live a life of virtue, implicitly affirming the efficacy of good works and proceeding humbly by means of vocal prayer. Unity. Teresa described the soul's intricate journey into the deepest chamber of itself, where the bridegroom lived a journey that could be completed only by a holy passive surrender to the divine will. In this unity way, the soul finally achieved fulfillment of its longing. Teresa described this as an ecstasy in which her heart was pierced by an arrow and she was set on fire by the bridegroom's all-consuming love, a pain that she hoped would last forever. Jan of the Cross. Jan of the Cross was a younger contemporary of Teresa and her paths across briefly. Since he was a learned theologian, his writings were more systematic than hers, although perhaps less direct and vivid. His major work, The Dark Night of the Soul, described the sense of utter abandonment that the soul experienced as it was being led into the high realms of spirit, spiritual union. The Arts one of the major religious divisions of the age was not over doctrine as such, but between liturgical and non-liturgical churches, Catholics, Lutherans, and Anglicans in the first group, Calvinists, and others in the second, a division that profoundly affected the arts. Protestant divisions, thus Zwinglians and after them Calvinists, Schmas statues and stained glass windows whitewashed the inside of churches and allowed no music except the unaccompanied chanting of psalms. Rembrandt was practically the only Calvinist artist of note, and biblical scenes were, practi were practically the only acceptable form of Protestant religious art, although even they were not permitted in churches. The Tridentine Esperit. Catholic churches, on the other hand, were huge, lavishly decorated buildings that, along with being places of worship, were in effect museums of painting and sculpture. The Catholic Reformation inspired great artistic creations, including drama. The Baroque. This sacramentalism justified the dazzling new expressions of art and music called the Baroque, a term of uncertain origin because of the Baroque's departures from the idea of symmetries of classical art. It may have derived from a Portuguese word for a twisted pearl. The Baroque was the prominent art of the Catholic Reformation. The Baroque spread as far as Latin America and Japan, but it flourished best in Europe. Patrons, both lay and, ex and ecclesiastical princes, especially the Greek papal families of the age. Medici, Farnese, Borghese, Barberini commissioned artistic works that proclaimed their piety, but also their importance. Dynamism. The Brook expressed dynamism rather than settled order in the restless, rather than the untroubled spirit. Its palpable stylistic tensions were perfectly suited to express the dramatic struggle to subdue the will, which presupposed the Catholic affirmation of free will and the efficacy of good works. The mystical experience was the highest expression of this striving, making the ecstasy of Saint Therese. The Saint swooning as an angel pierced her heart with a golden arrow. The piety of artists. The artists of the age were not merely filling commissions. Michelangelo, Bernini, Palestrina, and most others were devout Catholics who expressed their faith through their creations. Michelangelo, Michelangelo, agonized over his sins, and in the last judgment, 
and that she painted himself on the skin of Saint Bartholomew, which the saint who was flayed alive, his soul being over hell. Architecture. The renewed emphasis on Eucharistic piety had effects on architecture. The altar was the focus of the worshippers' attention, often under a magnificent canopy, and the tabernacle was set on the high altar as a visible affirmation of the real presence. The Church Triumphant As the Baroque style developed, it became the vehicle of Catholic triumph, celebrating an admittedly partial victory over Protestantism and a successful reassertion of the Church's spiritual authority. Rome Rebuilt Sixtus V systematically rebuilt Rome around its most important churches, putting the statues of, statues of Peter and Paul on top of the columns of the Roman emperors Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, and setting up Egyptian obelisk at strategic points around the city, each surmounted by a cross, thereby symbolizing the triumph of Christianity over paganism. St. Peter's completed. Urban the Eighth opened St. Peter's Basilica in 1626 as the greatest mm -hmm. structure in Christendom, where almost every detail was a proclamation of a faith that had survived its greatest crisis. The Papal throne and the giant statue of St. Peter reiterating Papal authority, the pillars around the high altar serving as huge reliquaries, the white panoply of saints overlooking St. Overlooking Peter's square, promising their protection and intercession to the faithful. The opening of St. Peter's marked the successful completion of a project that had begun as a disaster when the indulgence preached on its behalf triggered events that seemed to threaten the end of the church. Both the brand new churches and the rebuilt older ones were monumental testimonies to the revival of the papacy and of the church herself. End of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tess for the presentation. At least, nagkaroon tayo ng ID basic idea kung ano nangyari after the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation of the Church. All right. Meron pong tanong? Gusto niyo mag-reform pa? That's about seven minutes. Baka hindi na tayo matapos sa breakout room. Medyo pwede kayong magtanong na lang. For the meantime, habang si Sister Tessa and Dijan, and tingnan po natin kung anong po pwede natin mapag-usapan. Meron pong tanong so far? Mahaba-haba yung ano, mahaba-haba yung i-digest natin dito. Pero uh, kompleto po yun, lalo na sa treatment ng uh, yung reformation. At saka yung ang anong ginawa ng simbahan in order to do that counter-reformation in such a way na yung errors ng Protestantism ay mas, uh, ma, in a sense, para bang ma-counter, no? Meron pong tanong so far? Wala na po. Gabi na po. Sir, rest ka na. <laughs> Okay, kung ganun po, uh, pwede na tayong mag-close. Mag, uh, Tinan po natin ang nalilang.